welcome to the course evolution of the earth and life. Today we are going to talk about some very early concepts of origin of life. The question how life started on the planet was a very very old question. Philosophers and scientists thought about this question for a very long time. The first person to come up with a very precise statement of his views about how life came on the earth was Aristotle in 350 BC in a chapter in history of animals. He wrote that the primary uh, idea of how life evolved is from spontaneous generation. What it means, what he argued is if you look at decomposing flesh or vegetables, you are going to see a lot of flies which are coming out of it. And in his mind, he explained it that from those uh, decomposing uh, vegetables and meat, these flies are generating uh, spontaneously. And that is how life starts and once life starts it can change and it can pass from one generation to the other generation. But at the beginning that must have been the way how things started to generate. So in his words it says with animals some spring from parent animals according to their kind what we see around us today. Whilst others grow spontaneously and not from kindred stock. What it means again that we see some groups which we see around us especially in his time pets such as horses and uh, other pet animals. You see that they are basically uh, generating from their parent animals. But then there are uh, other animals such as flies that he has seen he was not sure how they originated and from his observation he thought that they simply come up from the decomposing flesh. And uh, that is why he concluded that they spontaneously generate in the inside of animals out of the secretions of their several organs. Now today it seems uh, quite hard to believe that somebody comes up with this kind of an explanation uh, in terms of spontaneous generation. But at that point uh, it was one of the most well accepted idea of how life originated. The major issue with that is at that point of time it was not possible to observe anything which is very small in size. Today we know that even in decomposing flesh there are flies which basically lay their eggs and because those eggs are microscopic we cannot really see it. So it may appear that uh, the decomposing flesh is generating flies all of a sudden without any uh, growing point but it actually has these growing points because flies come to these decomposing flesh or vegetables, they lay their eggs, those eggs transform to larvae and eventually uh, grow to full fledged flies. So with the help of microscopy we know these stages. But this again uh, was one of the most well accepted ideas of its time and it continues to be so till at some point at 1800s. But people started questioning this idea particularly as the observation got better. Everywhere where it was initially explained as the spontaneous generation, people started looking at it more thoroughly with multiple observations and they always found that there are eggs or there are larvae and therefore it, you cannot really call it a spontaneous generation. This debate went to the level uh, where most of the uh, scientific community were engaged in it and uh, Paris Academy of Science 
decided that they have the responsibility of um, changing it and therefore they declared a price. So, they said that whoever resolves this debate can get a prize and um, it has to be through a proper experiment uh, so that uh, people do not doubt it. And that is when uh, Louis Pasteur came uh, into resolving this issue and he asked this question, does life generate spontaneously or does it come only from already existing life? So, he designed two experiments. In one experiment, he took some dust and in that dust, uh, he ensured um, that there is air from outside and it is open and in that setup, what is the final product? Then he designed another experiment where he basically put the same dust, but he did not allow the air to pass and air to infiltrate this system and then he observed what happens then. So, because the idea was that does life generate spontaneously, it means that if you are thinking about life and if it generates spontaneously, it should be able to generate from things which are non-biological and that is why the dust. So, he set up an experiment where he had these uh, uh, liquid where he was adding dust and eventually checking whether you can see life uh, developing. And what he found that between the two setup, only in one he saw the development of microbial growth and by this time uh, they were equipped with high power microscopes and they can observe things which were very small. So, he could observe microbial growth, but that was happening in only the setup where air was allowed to infiltrate and interact with the system. The other experiment where air was not allowed and only dust was passing to the system, it showed no microbial growth and therefore, he concluded that all life comes from existing life and in this case, the existing life was actually coming through the air and if you stop the air to interact with this closed system, uh, then it is not going to create any life. So, this one experiment uh, resolved the long debate about spontaneous generation and uh, people were convinced that it was not the explanation the spontaneous generation was not the explanation of how, how life first started on the earth. But then the question was if this is not the case and especially the conclusion that all life comes from existing life, then how does the first life uh, appear? So, that is a more involved question. So, because Pasteur actually said that no spontaneous generation of life at least today and because the necessary conditions no longer exist. And then uh, various scientists started thinking about uh, how the initial condition could have affected the origin of life. And this broad idea is often called abiogenesis which basically means that development of life or biology from a biological material. So, it is not development of life from existing life, but it is development of life from non-living material. And pioneer ring ideas for these abiogenesis was something called prebiotic soup hypothesis. So, this was proposed by two scientists who were working independently and one was uh, Operin who was a Russian chemist and then another one an English biologist statistician uh, Halden. So, now this idea is called Operin Halden theory. What they proposed 
that things changed or things evolved or things started in terms of life from inorganic molecules, from things which are not really uh, existing life. So, in their idea, they summarize these major points. Number one, organic molecules formed, formed from a biological material or a biogenic material in the process of an external energy source and especially operin um, said that this external energy source could be um, ultraviolet rays or lightning something of that sort. The second condition that they thought is that the primitive atmosphere was reducing. And again, this is supporting some of the ideas of Pasteur that the present uh, condition around us is not uh, the same uh, where life originated or where life can could come from. And this reducing idea is important because Operin also observed that any molecule, especially the biological molecules, organic molecules, they have a tendency of converting or oxidizing or uh, breaking down very easily if there is enough oxygen. So, initially it has to be a reducing condition. The third point that he and Halden both of them uh, thought about was that the initial condition must have contained ammonia water vapor among other gases because these are very important when you think about the development of organic molecule. So, in their mind it was quite clear that life even at the beginning will consist of these organic molecules certain long chain organic molecules and you have to ensure that those organic molecules are stable and they can form. And for that all these conditions are necessary. So, that was their approach and their argument was that that was the initial transition from a biogenic material to organic molecules and the energy source needed for that came from ultraviolet rays um, or lightning. But again it was simply a theory and um, it was hard to test at that point of time. Increasingly, people also started realizing something about the conditions of the earth at the point where probably these uh, abiogenesis was taking place. And it clearly shows that the conditions on primitive earth were not the same as those that we see in the present day. So, one of the major changes is that the atmosphere was reducing on the primitive earth and now we know much better about it simply because there are rock records which clearly shows us that how the atmospheric conditions were at the primitive earth. We also know a bit about it from the observation of far away planets and uh, what would be the condition of the atmosphere if there was no life. So, far away planets or planets without life can work as a good model of how the primitive earth would have looked like especially in terms of its atmosphere. And that clearly shows us that there could not be any free oxygen at the beginning. There can be other things for example, free hydrogen or saturated hydrides such as uh, methane, ammonia, water vapor, these would be abundant. Now, the big question is what would lead to chemical reactions because chemical reactions require energy. And in the early earth or primitive earth, the energy for chemical reaction between these gases could come from electric discharge in storms or solar energy. Because today if we think about these uh, electric discharge or solar energy, solar wind, many of these are uh, 
we are shielded by it either by a strong magnetic field of the earth or more importantly about these electric discharge or ultraviolet rays those are being uh, we are being shielded from those by the ozone layer. Now, ozone layer forms only if you have enough oxygen and we at the primitive earth because there was no free oxygen therefore, the ozone layer was not present as a result these kind of electric discharge must have been common at that point of time. The other thing that we know that the earth's surface temperature was probably hotter than today couple of reasons one was that it was still cooling down the earth which we are talking about uh, almost 4 billion years ago and uh, over time earth has cooled down. So, that also acts as a point that initially the temperature must have been slightly higher. We are saying slightly higher because the sun's luminosity also changed over time it has gone down and therefore, with the balance uh, it must have been slightly hotter not a lot hotter from today especially when we are talking about the already formed crust which means it has cooled down, but in comparison to today's crustal level today's surface it was slightly hotter. With all these conditions it makes a very different world um, to compare uh, with modern day atmosphere and modern day earth surface. And therefore, just by looking at modern day earth surface it is very difficult to predict whether these changes the abiological molecules to biogenic organic molecules these conversions would take place it requires a completely different set of experiment. And one of the pioneering experiment came from a group in University of Chicago from a young uh, PhD student Stanley Miller and an established chemist uh, Harold Ure who was also a Nobel laureate. Now, the idea was quite simple. Um, Stanley Miller's idea was that he will create a primitive atmosphere and he will also ensure that it gets electric discharge and then he will observe whether it actually can generate any organic molecule. So, in this setup they started with this part of the experiment where in this particular chamber there is water, methane, ammonia and hydrogen. This is again based on uh, the understanding at that point of time about the composition of the primitive atmosphere. He also ensured that there are electrodes going through it creating sparks at a regular frequency again mimicking the initial condition of the earth where it the lightnings were much more common and there was no ozone layer and therefore, this particular uh, chamber does not have any oxygen in it. In fact, this entire system is closed up it is a closed system where there is no oxygen uh, whatsoever and that is extremely important. Now, what they did they basically had this chamber uh, where there is water methane ammonia hydrogen and it was spark I mean uh, there was a continuous spark with some regular interval. And then whatever is uh, happening here it gets to cool down and then it passes through this um, tap and this trap can take some of these things that are getting produced here. So, primarily some liquid which has water in it and anything that will get produced here will get trapped in this uh, small region, but part of it will also go back to this system where there is water and there is heating also. So, it heats up it will go up uh, because it gets bowent then it goes through the system and this process um, continues for quite some time. This is the gas inlet from which this methane and ammonia uh, 
are introduced and again as I am saying that this is a fairly closed system. So, nothing is coming out or going in after the initial setup of the experiment. So, after a week uh, of this experiment, Stanley Miller observed some interesting things. First of all, in the initial experiment uh, where he did not have this trap, it was difficult to find anything other than water and uh, this water was constantly circulating and he did not find a major change in the water chemistry. But then with the trap, some of the water was also getting uh, trapped inside and he started collecting materials from here and analyzing it. And what he found that after a week, 15 amino acids were found in this mixture. And that means that in this system, uh, we exactly know what went in and what produced and he concluded that water vapor, methane, ammonia, hydrogen in the presence of electric spark can produce amino acid, glycine, alanine and these amino acids are very important organic molecules. These are one of the most important uh, aspects of life. In ev all life, we have these amino acids. In later sets of experiments, um, he also uh, could produce things like nitrogenous bases and ribose. But the, this is one of those experiments where it clearly demonstrated that even with the primitive condition of the earth, uh, what we know uh, the conditions were. Uh, it is possible to produce a good number of organic uh, molecules, especially the amino acids from completely inorganic uh, or abiological materials. Now, what are the some of the uh, caveats of this experiment? Well, the composition of the primitive atmosphere at least at that point of time, um, it was not sure it was not uh, final whether this is the actual composition of the primitive atmosphere. But now we know that it is fairly good uh, representation of the primitive atmosphere. And this particular set of experiments provided the first empirical evidence that conditions on the primitive earth or at least what we understand about the conditions of the primitive earth could favor chemical reactions that synthesized more complex organic compounds from simple uh, organic precursors. Uh, so, it does not require a completely um, different mechanism, it's simple uh, reactions that can actually produce things which are uh, organic in nature and clearly in this entire system there is no biological intervention. So, it is not generating life from existing life, this is a closed system where there is no life inside and they have checked for it multiple times before the starting of the experiment that there is no microbial growth, there is no life, uh, so you are not adding anything from outside. And this is also one of the first experiments to provide empirical data, experimental data that supports the prebiotic soup hypothesis proposed by Operin and Halden. Operin and Halden's idea was simply an idea and it is a hypothesis, but this provided an experimental proof. So, finally, this paper uh, was a revolutionary paper, it came out in the scientific journal called Science and it was primarily Stanley Miller's uh, paper, but this set of experiments, um, the future experiments too, are known as Miller-Urey experiment. So, this showed some of the interesting ideas about how life must have originated in terms of this first conversion of abiological materials to organic molecules. So, in summary, today we learned what were some of the very basic ideas of how life originated on the earth 
about spontaneous generation and how Pasteur experimentally resolved that spontaneous generation is not possible. We learned about ideas like abiogenesis which was proposed and uh, uh, finally one of the uh, very distinct ideas of abiogenesis called operin halogen theory which talks about prebiotic soup and development of life from uh, inorganic molecules or uh, abiological materials to complex organic molecules. We also saw how this idea was tested and eventually supported by Ure Miller experiment. These are some of the resources that I used for uh, this particular lecture and here is a question for you to think about. Thank you.